So firstly, I would like to introduce Paul Shorthouse. Um, I would like to congratulate him on his new role as Managing Director of the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition, which was just announced last week, I believe. Um, he is also the Senior Director at Globe Series and the leader of the Green and Circular Economy practice at the Delphi Group. Um, so he will be presenting on the circular economy, of course. Um, Paul is one of Canada's leading experts in the emerging circular economy, uh, providing solutions and engaging leaders who are working in the intersection of business innovation, policy, economic development, and sustainability. Um, for over a decade, this work has placed him at the forefront of the important transition that is underway towards a greener, more prosperous, low carbon economy. So thank you. And Paul, you can take it away. Great. Well, thanks for that warm welcome. I am going to try and share my screen here, make sure uh, you can all follow along. I've been asked to just provide a, a bit of an overview of circular economy for people that may not be as familiar with the opportunities and the model itself and sort of where we're at in Canada. So if I can uh, do, do that, let me know and see my cover screen here. Looks great. Okay, super. Um, so it's fair to say um, that right now we're living in a linear economy. And by linear, I mean, we extract our resources, we make something, we use it, and then at the end of life, for the most part, we dispose of these materials after use. Uh, every year, we're taking more than 100 billion tons of raw materials globally, and we're transforming that into new products, uh, but only about 8.6% of the planet's materials and resources that are used in these products are actually cycled back into the economy at the end of their use. So two thirds of uh, all these materials actually end up in the environment as unrecoverable waste or pollution. So garbage in landfills, plastics into the oceans, carbon dioxide as a sort of waste byproduct from burning fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And the Circular Economy, an organization out of the Netherlands uh, calls this the circularity gap. So the reality is this linear economy is, is uh, putting a lot of pressure on the planet and our natural ecosystems. And it also exacerbates some of our current social inequalities. The linear economy, uh, it, it presents some enormous lost economic opportunities, obviously by not failing, or by failing, I should say, to, to recapture the value of these material resources. And just to give you some idea, you know, for every uh, roughly about a third of all the food that uh, that is purchased or or used, you know, globally, about one third of that um, actually ends up as as waste. So about a trillion U.S. dollars, or in Canada, about forty nine billion dollars of of food is wasted every year in Canada. Um, in the United States, they estimate about ten billion dollars per year worth of materials enter the landfill. Um, across the country of which you know, much of that could be recovered. So uh, needless to say, our current linear economy is also steering us toward a climate change disaster, about uh, three to six degree temperature increase um, over the next uh, couple of decades. And if we continue with this business as usual approach, we'll be emitting about 65 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions globally in 2030, when we need to really be moving towards net zero and pretty quickly. So the answer, the circular economy model, is really what's come to the forefront as a solution for moving away from today's linear society and for addressing the, the growing global environmental and social issues and, and risks. Um, it's fair to say that the circular economy model provides actionable ways to address the current resource pressures and also one of the only ways, I would say, to getting to deep greenhouse gas emission reductions. The projections show that adding circular economy solutions to climate change targets will allow us to keep global temperature rise below two degrees. Uh, so while the term circular economy, I would say, is relatively new in North America, the underlying concepts have been around for decades and are based on principles that include sustainable development, industrial ecology, design for environment, cradle to cradle. Um, and it's really underpinned by sort of three key principles. So the first one is rethink. So reducing resource consumption and designing waste out from the beginning, removing harmful chemicals and pollution from products and services. The second is optimize. So keeping products and components at their highest value 
and in use for as long as possible while minimizing the material losses. So that includes uh, design for durability and reuse and repairability. And the last is regenerate. So preserving ecosystems and regenerating natural capital in the process. And uh, the circular economy, it sees material flows as being part of two distinct cycles, biological and technical loops. So biological loops are about ensuring that organic materials and biomass return to the biosphere after use. So food waste, organics, or wood products used in construction is two examples. Um, technical loops are where we look at sort of a focus on inorganic materials such as metals and minerals. And it's about keeping these materials in closed loops to ensure that they're recycled and can be reused again and again. And I should say that um, circular economy is not about ending the idea of growth, but rather about bending economic activities back into harmony with nature. So you're actually looking at sort of a world of prosperity with finite resources. Uh, and it actually presents a, an opportunity for resource countries such as Canada in that sense. So it's exciting because of the economic opportunities in my mind, and they're pretty significant. Uh, uh, Accenture uh, has suggested that the circular economy could generate about $4.5 trillion US in additional economic activity or output by 2030 and up to 25 trillion US by 2050. The World Economic Forum has considered sort of circular business models as, a, as providing a competitive advantage because they create more value for each, re, each unit of resource than the traditional linear take, make and dispose model. And I would say as the uh, circular economy model has become as sort of evolved and, and the benefits are, are becoming better known to governments and to companies and communities at large. Um, we're recognizing that they, that they are significant. They can add to the resiliency of communities and to businesses and also spur significant amount of innovation. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, economic uh, sort of focus on circular economy can help to tackle some of the deep greenhouse gas emissions that are needed to get to our, our climate targets. So they estimate that about two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions are released during the extraction, processing or manufacturing of goods. And by applying circular economy just to five key areas, so cement, aluminum, steel, plastics and food could reduce our global emissions by 40% in 2050. Um, it also helps us to address some of the land use change issues and the non-energy sort of industrial activities. So, Opportunities there, and I would say there's four key drivers to think about um, as underlying enablers for, for the circular economy. And the first driver is partnerships. So we need to come together and address some of the siloed thinking of, uh, and, and think more across sector and systems thinking. Uh, we need to think about uh, you know, the current lack of awareness around this, around the opportunities to grow the market demand for circular products and services. And I'm sure Adam will touch a bit on that. Uh, and the need to address some of the data and information gaps by creating more robust metrics and indicators for tracking kind of the, the transition to circularity. A second driver is policy. So we need to better harmonize our policy efforts and use policy to drive circular economy through better regulation, through incentives and other economic instruments. And also we can leverage sort of purchasing power through procurement. Innovation is another key driver. So we need to address the current innovation gap as it relates to circular economy in Canada by investing not only, not only in uh, sort of technology innovation, but also in process and organizational and product design and business model and supply chain and social innovation to really get this sort of systemic change that we're looking for. And then investment. So we need to ensure that we're investing effectively in the circular economy through um, the appropriate financing mechanisms and funding models, but also addressing some of the infrastructure gaps that include recycling and organics processing, the remanufacturing infrastructure, reuse, reuse and repair, uh, which we'll hear a little bit more uh, later on in this meeting. Uh, information and communication technologies. There's a digital piece to this. So the transition to dematerializing physical objects to, to the sharing economy and, and uh, digital solutions uh, and green infrastructure and, and nature-based solution infrastructure. So what's happening in Canada at the moment? And I would say that, you know, the, the awareness and momentum is building around, around this. Um, a lot of work uh, across governments and policy side. So there's the Ocean Plastics Charter that was signed a few years back by the federal government. There's quote work on sort of plastic waste with the provinces and the federal government. Plastics is being used as sort of a, an inroads to a lot of the awareness around circular economy. So we're, we're leveraging that. 
provincial policies and extended producer responsibility, which I'm sure many here are familiar with, as well as all the local government circular economy and zero waste priorities. So that's on the policy side. On industry side, we've got you know, a lot of convening across different sectors, a national bioeconomy strategy. There's work by the National Industrial Symbiosis Pro Program in Canada to kind of bring industry together to look at one industry's waste as a resource for another sector. Um, lots of leadership around small businesses and startups and incubators creeping up. And then the last three points there I'm gonna to touch on because they're uh, closer to the work that I'm doing. So the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition, it was launched in 2018. It's a network of leaders from all industries and sectors who are fostering collaboration and innovation and knowledge exchange in Canada to try and accelerate the transition to the circular economy. Um, the initial members are a combination of nonprofit and academic think tanks and a handful of corporate leaders in Canada. Some of their logos are, are here on the, the right side of the screen. And as of last week, I've taken on the role as managing director of the Leadership Coalition, and I'm going to be focused on expanding the network and driving efforts to amplify some of this leading edge work that's already underway. Um, and trying to support sort of the, the innovation and synergies among business leaders and policymakers and academic researchers and others to help drive some of that meaningful change. One of the projects or initiatives, I should say, that the Circular Economy Leadership Coalition has launched is the Canada Plastics Pact, and that brings together industry and other stakeholders across the entire plastics value chain uh, in Canada to really focus on eliminating plastic pollution across Canada. And the CPP has uh, a framework they set out that's four key target areas that you can see here by 2025. And it's aligned with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's new plastics economy work and the other uh, global PACs that include uh, PACs out of Europe and also most recently the United States. So trying to get some harmonization around efforts here. The Circular Economy Leadership Coalition also launched the Circular Economy Solutions Series last fall. And it's a research and virtual convening platform that's powered by Globe Series, which is a, a sort of a, an event convening organization. Uh, and the solution series, it's building, we're trying to build out a number of streams of activities under different themes or areas, um, bringing key stakeholders together across Canada, North America more broadly. And we're working in areas that include supply chain innovation, circular plastics, mining and metals, uh, food systems, and the built environment. So launching both the food and the built environment uh, in the next couple of weeks. And you can sign up for updates if you're interested to learn more about upcoming events or the research. Um, at the website here. So Circular Economy Solutions Series with an S on the end of solutions. Uh, you can get, uh, get updates there. And then lastly, uh, we're helping to support Environment Climate Change Canada and the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA, with the planning for the World Circular Economy Forum that's being hosted in Canada um, in September 13th to 15th. And this event brings together more than 2,000 people from 200 different countries. Um, it'll likely be mostly virtual. Um, it was meant to be hosted in Toronto, but there's going to be an opportunity to, to engage a broad set of stakeholders around the World Circular Economy Forum. So again, this is another flagship activity that's helping to build awareness in Canada. And so just to summarize, um, multiple benefits in terms of a huge opportunity for Canada to rethink how our resources are used and recaptured and our products are designed and repaired and new services are leveraged to a low carbon economy. Um, more opportunity to note, you know, that Canada does not, we're not looking to close doors on trade or resource extraction, but rather allow more value to be captured from our natural resources and materials and our products and services. It's fair to say we need to address some of the barriers and accelerate the transition here. Um, but we need to consider those four key drivers I mentioned earlier, and not in terms of uh, a siloed approach, but interconnected as part of a system. Um, we need to consider also circular economy from different contexts. So the urban and rural, recognizing sort of our various cultures and diversities um, as a country and, you know, in the province of BC where I'm based, as well as the unique strengths and characteristics of uh, the current Canadian economy and, and where we're at. And lastly, uh, collaboration is really key. So I think we've seen through the COVID pandemic that innovation and collaboration are really essential for addressing some of the global crises that, we, that we're experiencing. Um, that transformation can happen rapidly when we collectively put our minds to the task. So I'll wrap up there, but uh, happy to answer questions or uh, enter the, uh, the discussion after my, my presentation. Amazing, thank you Thanks so much. much.
Um, yeah, so we have time for a few questions. Um, if anyone, if you want to have any questions, you can either, yeah, either throw your hand up, throw your virtual hand up, or um, throw a star in the chat. seeing anything oh eric um yeah hi thanks for the presentation it was actually really, really good i had one question about this um so and i'm located in the vancouver lower mainland by the way um and i what i wanted to know was if there's anything that you know of that's in the works right now uh to legislate consumer packaging on imported products i know that's very common in europe so for example unrecyclable plastics and things like that we see it all the time um, do, does anyone know if there's anything in the works for that, uh, government or otherwise? Yeah, great question. Um, one of the four pillars, I should say, within the Canada Plastics Pact work is to, and, and the first sort of, I guess, area of focus for the Canada Plastics Pact is all around plastics packaging. Um, but it's, it's around looking at the, um, the different innovation pathways and looking at opportunities to uh, you know, eliminate or look at other models or, or um, reduce the amount of impact, but also look at recycled content of packaging. And then lastly, making sure that the infrastructure is there to capture it after, after use. Like you, like you touched on there, a lot of the packaging comes from outside of, out of the country or the manufacturing takes place outside of Canada. So there's less of a, an opportunity, I would say, for the plastics pack to, um, you know, influence the manufacturers themselves, but they can as you said, put in some regulation around what enters the country and some stipulation on that. So that's, I think, where the Canada Plastics Pact is going to be focused is trying to, um, you know, work with the U.S. Plastics Pact and other international agencies, the Alan MacArthur Foundation, for example, to influence and advocate for those changes, whether regulation would come um, at sort of a provincial level or, you know, harmonize federally, locally. Um, I think that still is a work in progress there's discussions underway but i don't i don't think anything has been announced officially but uh happy to put you in touch eric with the canada plastics pack managing director he's uh fairly new to his role as well that's the plastics pack was launched uh, a few weeks ago his name is george roder but um can make an introduction there if you're interested in connecting with that group i would be interested thank you Awesome. Thank you. And then just to confirm, Paul, um, I do have your slides. Is it all right if I share them around? Because we've had a few requests. Okay, wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, I can put my uh, email. I guess my email is in the, in the last slide there, but I'll drop it in the chat box as well if people want to send me a note. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, um, so if it's cool, then we're going to move on to Alice. Um, so quickly, Alice is coming from the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. Um, and she is a researcher, facilitator, and program coordinator with expertise in zero waste and the circular economy, as well as collaborative decision making. So she brings experience in the repair economy, working on textile waste, social innovation, and investigating the secondhand economy and lighter living landscape, and working as part of a tech startup in the sharing economy to her current work as a senior project coordinator of the Just Circular Recovery and Transition Program under the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. Um, Alice is excited to support invent innovators, public institutions, and our communities as we rethink how our systems can work and how our economies can better support all peoples and our planet. So I, with that, I will turn it over to Alice. And are you, do you have Thank a you. screen share? Yep. Uh, everyone can see this? Yeah, looks great. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, so as Alex said, I'm with the Share Use Repair Initiative. Um, we're a project on the Makeway Canada shared platform, formerly Tides Canada. Um, and I'm going to be talking about right to repair today. But before that, I'll give you a little background on our, our organization. Ooh, there we go. Um, our mission is to create a robust sharing, reuse, and repair sector. So looking at those inner loops of what Paul described um, in the circular economy just before me, um, and we see it as a waste and climate solution, particularly because it enables all people to live well within household budgets, and it also supports the development of more sustainable and just local economies. And so why share, reuse, and repair? 
Um, 45% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from the production and consumption of our stuff. And 90% uh, of those greenhouse gas emissions comes from the production side. So when we're looking at share reuse and repair, we're really looking at ways of uh, extending the lifespan of the things that we use. So we don't have to um, emit as much greenhouse gases on that production in the creation of new things. Um, we also see these as sustainable solutions that are affordable and accessible. Um, in a lot of ways, the sustainability movement, the environmental movement, the green movement um, have been very trendy um, in some ways uh, in targeting certain, certain communities while leaving others aside. We see share use and repair as actions that anyone can take um, that go across all communities. There's also a lot of net job creation potential here. Um, so for instance, uh, the Solid Waste Association of North America uh, talked about in 2003 that for every 1,000 tons of electronic waste, while it would employ one person to landfill it and 15 people to recycle it, it could employ 200 people to repair that e-waste and uh, reuse it instead. In terms of the right to repair, this is now a growing conversation um, globally, and it's it, really the leadership on it is um, primarily in the European Union right now. The reason why right to repair is becoming an aspect of conversation is because of um, looking at the accessibility of parts and the knowledge to repair things uh, comes often into conflict with intellectual property um, laws. And so in 2019, the European Union introduced their Eco Design Directive, uh, which primarily targeted household appliances. And so this was looking, this um, legislated that companies had to make parts and, man and manuals, the knowledge available um, while those uh, products were on the market, as well as uh, up to seven to 10 years after they were no longer available on the market. Uh, similarly, uh, just this past fall, the EU introduced the Circular Economy Action Plan, and that plan includes right to repair legislation to come out in 2021 that is going to cover things like personal electronics that include computers and smartphones. Um, among the EU members, one of the trailblazers is really France, which introduced a repairability index just last month. And so that is rating items on a scale of one to 10 for um, their repairability, but also their general durability and longevity as well. Um, a durability index is actually set to come out in 2024, building off this repairability index. Um, and I really also want to highlight too uh, that there's actually a TV show on BBC called The Repair Shop, and they describe themselves as an antidote to throwaway culture because right to repair is more than just um, getting people the access they need to repair their things and have the right to do so, but it's also changing the narrative of how we view our things. And so building on that, um, also globally, Australia's Productivity Commission is investigating the right to repair. Um, as well on this changing the narrative aspect, Singapore's uh, National Design Center had an um, has been running an exhibit uh, during the past year called R for Repair. And they point, uh, one of the exhibit's creators pointed out that repair is associated, has become associated with being unable to buy new things. And oftentimes that's not the case. It's just keeping the things that you love and cherish around, the things that have worked for you for a long time and get them to continue working. It's and so there's also a narrative change that is happening that repair is, um, is not something for, for those that can't afford a replacement. In the context of North America, we're start, um, right to repair legislation has been introduced across 14 different states. Uh, what that legislation looks like is a little bit different depending on the state. So for instance, in Florida, it's, it's focusing more on the farmer's right to repair, um, where other areas such as in Oregon, it's a little bit more broader. Um, there is the automotive right to repair that has been legislated and it was upheld in Massachusetts in the past 2020 election, which is becoming a really big deal as our cars 
include a lot more computer aspects to them than just the mechanical aspects that automobiles have previously um, included. So this right to repair of our automobiles being upheld is a big deal. Um, similarly, US PERG, the public interest research group study that found that repair could reduce household expenditures on electronics and appliances by 22%. Uh, so about 330 US dollars per year, which across 120 million households in the US comes out to about $40 billion of savings uh, by allowing repair on electronics and appliances. So what, how does this exist in Canada? Um, a private member bill was introduced in Ontario um, but ended up failing. It was the focus of the bill was right to repair of personal electronics. Um, and because it was a private member bill, it, it didn't, um, when it was introduced, it also a lot of um, news outlets also include that it had a low chance of success. Um, a bill in Quebec was also introduced in 2019. I haven't seen where it's gotten to yet. I've only, the status is only that was introduced in April, 2019. This bill is a little bit more broad. It includes um, aspects more similar to what Euro the European, European Union Eco Design Directive includes. And so that includes a fine for companies that um, are found guilty of planned obsolescence. But it also is looking at creating a repairability index as well as um, having parts and um, repair manuals available for a certain amount of time after a product is no longer available on the market. Um, in Canada, we also have the right to repair for our automobiles um, legislated through the Canadian Automotive Service Information Standard, which was passed in 2011. So quick look at the stats. Um, Open Media did a survey, uh, I believe in 2019 as well, that found that 75% of Canadians support right to repair legislation. Uh, Equitaire in Quebec also did an entire study around the role of obsolescence. And they found that psychological obsolescence or the feeling that something is no longer good enough, it's not trendy, you're behind in sort of the tech or the style or it's out of fashion was the main reason for replacing high-end devices. But that functional and technological obsolescence was the main reason for replacing mid-range to low-end devices. So we're also seeing how this issue is affecting people in different, um, in different econo uh, class economic classes. Uh, similarly on the ground, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what this looks like for different areas. So in terms of farming equipment, uh, certain companies are talking, have been talking about how their equipment, uh, when farmers buy it, they're actually leasing it. Um, as farming equipment includes more and more uh, computer aspects as well, and that uh, that they can't make the repairs to this equipment because uh, it includes intellectual property, which is particularly difficult for farmers because if they miss if that if they need that repair at a certain time in the harvest season, they are missing key key profits as well. The farming community. Um, uh, a stat came out in the past year or two showing that 95% of farmers often can do their own repairs. And so it's a community that is very self-reliant in terms of repair. So um, being unable to do, being told that they can't because they are infringing on intellectual property becomes an issue. Um, in terms of smartphones, um, there are a number of videos that I could share that, um, but where there are companies that are essentially starting to design to thwart individual repair. So if you take two brand new models of their smartphone, switch out the parts, um, you're actually going to lose functionality, even though you're switching brand new parts between two brand new phones. Um, they have it set up so uh, they'll recognize that that part is from a different source and it'll reduce the functionality of your device. Around computers, this has become a really big issue during the pandemic and so much of our life has turned to uh, virtual aspects. And so I have, uh, this is a picture of a 17 year old who testified to the Economic Matters Committee in Maryland around right to repair. And he, he does computer repairs and he was saying that 
folks during the pandemic when they were seeking out repairs from the company that created that made their computer they were looking at a wait time of four to eight weeks for that repair to be completed which as we know especially during during the pandemic that's it can't that gets in the way of a ton of work being completed um and so in some cases he was charging he would be charging nine hundred dollars to fix a computer that if they got the company to fix it could be done for free but that wait time was just a really big problem and then of course medical equipment um, as ventilators have become so necessary for certain communities um, during the fight with covid being able to repair that medical equipment and when a service technician can't come out for that is really necessary and so this, I, this was a big, <laughs> very, um, very large overview of, of Right to Repair. Um, I encourage you, you can visit our website to learn more about us. You can also look up your local repair cafes and businesses. Um, this is an example, a local repair cafe mapped out all the repair businesses and cafes within the lower mainland. Um, and you can also contact me um, but essentially, this is a growing issue, and a lot of legislation is expected to be introduced in 2021 in, across global contexts. So, um, happy to give a little brief about it um, as you see more of that news coming up. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Alice. And just to confirm, um, could I also share these slides around with everybody? Because we've had a few requests. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Um, thank you. And then I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions as well. If anybody has questions, um, you know, hands. Uh, John? We haven't spoken of it, but I have friends with personal experience. They buy fairly expensive uh, home appliances, which last instead of 15 or 20 years, last only five or six. And then they have difficulty getting them repaired if it's even possible, which seems dismal and regressive. But yeah, just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, something I didn't include here, but um, there has been also um, a decrease in how long people expect their appliances and electronics to last because of how the industry has changed. Um, some of those expectations. And oftentimes it is sort of, they'll frame it as like, oh, but the technological innovation, like it's outdated after five years, but at the same time, replacing something like a household appliance, which is a quite a large expenditure for a household. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sarah? Is there another Sarah? It's me, right? Yeah, it's you. Okay. Um, yeah, my question was mainly just about like the legislative requirements that would address the, oh, well, this is my, you know, an intellectual property. And if I'm, you know, Frankensteining my phones together, uh, you know, like, I feel like innovation drives uh, people doing things and fixing things and getting to know how to do things. And so, like, from the lawmaker's stance, which is apparently all of us, and... <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can we sort of address this? Because there's a lot more sort of legal framework to support the intellectual property and the, you know, the, the bell, oh, I invented this. So it has to be 50 years at least and profits coming my way. And I don't know, you know, we could pass a motion on the municipal front of 200 people to be like, oh, we want to be able to fix our stuff because we already kind of do like we're where my personal circumstances were far from other fix it places. So we do have a lot of these people who sort of Jimmy rig things together. Um, but where, where that should be going is needs to be sort of like come from the top too, and not just from the bottom up. And I'm wondering about if anybody has any ideas about that kind of legislation where it would be sort of supporting um, the, like you said about the jobs people, people have a lot more jobs to fix broken stuff than to recycle or landfill them. So mm -hmm. I feel like from that element, we really owe it to our citizens to figure out how to make lives of our electronics or washing machines or whatever longer and not just mm -hmm. continuously reduce it. 
sorry. I don't know if that's a question anymore. Sorry. I yeah, I can look into the wording that particular legislation has used, but I can also um, include a resource um, in my slides when I share it about uh, there have been. Uh, there are groups of security experts that have essentially testified and sort of um, come out saying like if right to repair becomes an issue for the security of your software, that in itself is an issue that your your software maybe needs to be a bit more secure as well. Um, and so I can share that um, with the slides. Awesome, thanks. And then can we just I uh, have one more Ramona and I think that's the last one we have time for. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I, I love this stuff and thank you for um, the presentation. Um, I am just wondering um, if you know if there is also uh, training programs in BC uh, for leaders for uh, repair cafes. What I've been told by my handy dandy re uh, fridge repairman is, is that um, he is a dying breed. Mm. And um, so it seems we need some bright minds that are interested in uh, taking this on because they have the capacity and the interest and, uh, and the commitment, but I'm not sure where you find them. So um, that would be, uh, that would be an interest is training programs. Yeah, I can look into it in terms of repair cafes that are more volunteer led often um, how that works is you can actually um, volunteer at the cafe and learn from the fixers that are already established within that community and and eventually become a fixer yourself but in terms of training programs for maintenance professionals. Um, I'd be happy to look into what resources there are for that in DC. I would imagine that would be like from the like the main tag repairman himself, right? You know, like it would be company driven. Yeah, I know some industries it's it's company driven. I'm not quite sure for all the different aspects of repair, but can definitely look into it. And I will try and answer some of the questions that I'm seeing pop up in the chat as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alice. That was great. Um, and so now I'm going to go over to our last presentation, um, who is Adam Cornell from, who is the founder of Unbuilders. Um, so Adam is a passive house builder turned unbuilder and an entrepreneur with an extensive background in uh, deconstruction and reclaimed wood. Um, he flipped his first house at 16 with his father and after years in the building industry he launched Unbuilders Deconstruction in January of 2018. Um, he is driven to make a positive impact in systemic industry change. Adam is passionate about his family, skiing, hiking, mountains, and spending as much time outdoors as he can. He is committed to providing a sustainable future for generations to enjoy. So with that, I can pass it over to Adam. And I'm not sure if you have slides. Yeah. Uh, let me just share this. There we go. Everything look good? Looks great. Okay, so thank you, Alex, uh, for the intro and uh, Paul and Alice for your presentations. Those are great and lead, I think, nicely into my presentation. Uh, so I am the founder and CEO of two companies, Unbuilders and Heritage Lumber. Um, and we are an example of a circular economy in the construction industry. Um, Alex did a pretty good intro to me. The only thing I'll touch on is that um, there's actually some people on this on this call who I'm currently working with, um, but I'm also a policy change advisor to the city of Vancouver, the city of Victoria and other regions here. And I am happy to speak with anyone in municipal, provincial, federal government on policy change in construction um, because it's not my mission to just grow my business. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking to help lead the entire industry towards the circular economy um, out of dire need. So when we look at the construction industry and, and break it down, um, construction and demolition is one of the largest polluters in Canadian society. Um, when you look at the amount of waste the industry is generating in Canada alone, um, CND generates 4 million tons of waste annually. It's close to 40% of the total solid waste in the country. Um, 
And when you break that waste down, when it goes to the landfill, it decomposes, it generates, it creates methane, and that goes up in the atmosphere. It's equivalent to about 20 million tons of CO2 released every year. Um, looking at that waste and breaking it down as to what it is, about 37% of it is just straight lumber, 1.5 million tons. 100% of that material is salvageable or recyclable in the least. There's no reason it should be in the landfill. And then breaking that wood down even further as to what is this lumber, a high portion of it is actually old growth lumber. So it's extremely valuable lumber that we no longer cut. And I'll go into a little bit of details on that later. Um, but again, there's no reason these materials should be in the landfill. When you're looking at the current construction linear uh, framework, um, I won't spend much time here because Paul did a great job, but we have an industry that we harvest raw materials, we build our buildings, and then we demolish them and dump them at the end of the life. So we all know about single use plastics. Um, what we're dealing with in construction is single use buildings with single use products. Uh, it makes even less sense. And again, the volumes, the scale of it is enormous. So if you compare the construction waste to just plastics, which we're all really aware of how big a problem it is, um, construction is 4 million tons annually. Plastics are about 2.8 million tons annually. So construction waste is significantly larger in volume. And uh, it's something that's actually, there's a solution for, which I'll get into now. As I'm sure most of you have probably witnessed in your neighborhoods, um, this is the traditional demolition process, uh, which is just not only illogical, it's extremely wasteful. Um, it's harmful to the community's health, um, which I'll touch on as well. And it's a process that we're going to look back on in five to 10 years and just shake our heads and, and be just amazed that this is how we used to remove buildings um, at the end of their life or when the property owner wanted to develop something new. Um, so again, you have a completely intact house in this scenario being destroyed and all of those materials are going to the landfill to decompose. Looking at our solution, so we essentially have three pillars, um, two of which are companies within our umbrella, uh, and a third is our partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, so UnBuilders is a service provider. We deconstruct buildings, we dismantle them layer by layer, and we maximize the salvaging of the goods and minimize the waste. We're the first dedicated deconstruction company in the country. So there's some demolition companies that do a little bit of salvage, but our entire mandate is to salvage and to minimize the waste. So we're approaching the industry from the exact opposite uh, lens. Uh, last year alone, we diverted um, close to 2,500 tons from our projects. And this year we're gonna more than double that as we've been doubling our service uh, year over year for the last three years since our inception. Our average on a deconstruction is about 95% uh, material diversion through either salvaging or recycling and we've actually hit over 99 percent on some of our houses heritage lumber is the back end of the business and it's a reclaimed wood brokerage so we're receiving materials currently from just on builders and we've established a large receiving yard at a private landfill and wood recycler in richmond and this year we'll open up that yard to receive materials from other contractors um, as policy in the city of Vancouver is about to take a big step forward and mandate more deconstruction. Uh, we know that our competitors are going to be springing up later this year, and we want to make sure that they have an outlet for the materials um, because deconstruction only works if the materials have a place to go for resale or remanufacturing, uh, which also leads to Habitat for Humanity. We have this fantastic partnership with them. Um, the Rebuild Hub logo in the middle is actually an initiative that Habitat is champion. Uh, championing and we are partners with them. Um, so we've received grant funding from the city of Vancouver to build a physical hub of goods again to uh, anticipate the wave of materials that's going to be coming out of deconstruction as it's mandated over the next few years. And all of our goods that uh, aren't lumber go to Habitat for Humanity. They also receive some of the lumber and the other positive spin of this not only for having an outlet but um, they sell these goods in restore and they use the proceeds to build affordable housing. So in mandating deconstruction, you're actually also having uh, action towards the affordability crisis in, in the housing market. And this is what 
uh, an old deconstruction looks like uh, from our sites. This is done by hand. We now are using heavy machinery, which I'll show you next. Um, but we are really reverse engineering a building. So we've already stripped the inside out. We've taken out the fixtures, finishes, windows, and doors. And the drywall is gone. The asbestos is gone all to the appropriate facilities. And then we're taking the frame down by hand. And you can see we're sorting the lumber on site. We're sorting the metal into our dump trailer. And when the materials leave our site, they're, they're all uh, homogeneous and they're, they're going to the correct facility. Um, this house is one of the houses we hit over 99% diversion on um, and had a huge salvage rate. Now looking at what, what is this lumber that we're recovering um, in particular in, in the Pacific Northwest, um, but this is fairly consistent across the country and really across North America. So we were framing our buildings with old growth lumber up until the 1970s. This is the giant old trees that you can see pictured here um, that used to cover, I mean, the entire continent, but the, the Northwest was the last uh, frontier for this, this beautiful lumber. Um, Sadly, we're still cutting these trees today. There's only about 3% left and uh, they're still being logged on Vancouver Island and, and the coast, um, which is just insanity in my mind. Um, and the irony here is uh, the only place that you can find this lumber that these trees were cut down and, and, and uh, processed into dimensional lumber is locked behind our walls. And so again, this is a really Really highly valuable material that we're throwing in the landfill. It, it makes no sense at all. It's a scarce resource. Every demolition that we allow to take place makes, makes it uh, so there's less and less of this material available for, for capturing and putting back into the supply chain. And so Vancouver is the youngest city in the country. It's probably the youngest major city in, in, in the world, really, founded in 1886. And even though it's young, it was built with ancient trees that are locked behind the walls. And it's something that we need to capture and we need to take pride in, in capturing. Um, we really shouldn't have cut as many trees as we did, but now we have to go and recover them and not allow this material to go to the landfill. And the benefits of lumber, um, old growth lumber is about three times stronger than lumber of today. So it's a better wood, tighter grain, and it has a really beautiful aesthetic. And reclaimed wood in general is, has 12 times less embodied carbon than new lumber. So it's the most sustainable building material in the market. And that's really what drove me into unbuilding, shifted me from building, um, besides the fact that we were still building in a single use way, which really bothered me. Um, I wanted to get to a point where we were, we could influence the demolition industry so that we had a vast amount of reclaimed wood on the market to start rebuilding our buildings with, and again, have a lighter footprint for the future. And just some, some pictures of some reclaimed products from my building past um, when I was a builder and renovator. Um, so these are, these are materials that we recovered within Vancouver, manufactured and reinstalled in, in homes and, and condos in Vancouver. And so this is circularity uh, and the circular economy happening in real time within single communities. And there's a wide variety, basically anywhere you see wood in a project in a house or a building, it could be reclaimed wood and it should be more often than not. Uh, it doesn't have to just be the rustic look like you see in the middle. You can hit any, any design aesthetic based on how you finish and, uh, and process the material. Now, the other uh, barrier that we've had with deconstruction in general is the time it takes to deconstruct. And so we've now adapted to utilizing heavy machinery. As you can see here, we're using a crane to pull apart the building in big sections. And this is a way that we're actually now competing directly against demolition for time. This house was supposed to take us three weeks to dismantle this frame. Uh, we did it in less than two days with the crane. And so we're continually optimizing our service to drive the time down and drive the price down um, because we, we recognize that legislation won't be in place everywhere in the country um, in a matter of a few years, but we wanna have on builders across the country in a matter of a few years. And so we're building the business to scale to any region. Looking at the benefits of deconstruction and shifting this industry from demolition to deconstruction, the benefits are, are enormous. Um, and this is where I think a lot of politicians in particular can get some good buzzwords to really um, show the industry and, and the community why this needs to happen. And it needs to happen very fast. So jobs, this is a, a, a great thing for any, any uh, region. 
in just BC alone, we calculate that the shift to deconstruction will generate 45,000 new jobs. That includes the existing demolition jobs. And nationally, that's 250,000 jobs. And that's just the deconstruction service alone. That's because there's six crew members for every one machine operator on our job sites. And those jobs are also lasting a little bit longer. So the job uh, creation is even greater. And then when you look at all the offshoot economic activity, um, the, the amount of jobs that will be created from this shift, uh, we, we can't even calculate between transportation, used building material sales, woodworkers, carpenters, designers, and the various recycling streams as these materials are shifted out of the landfills and into various recycling streams, let alone the innovation um, and entrepreneurs that will spark up from trying to solve certain materials and keeping them out of the landfill, materials that we currently don't have an end, an end product for. And then just the economics of it, in Metro Vancouver, we're looking at three, adding $3.4 billion to the economy through shifting deconstruction. And nationally, that's nearly $19 billion. And again, that's just the service and the lumber. That's not the other, um, the, the other, the other offshoot industries that'll spark up from it. And looking at the impact, um, there's three major tenants that, that are really having positive impact. I've already touched on the environmental impact just diverting this waste, avoiding CO2 going into the atmosphere and avoiding our landfills from overflowing. Both Vancouver and Victoria landfills are scheduled to be full 10 to 12 years ahead of schedule. And that means in order to satisfy the current waste, construction waste appetite, we would have to clear more highly expensive, highly valuable land to then just dump our materials. Looking at health, um, the truth of the demolition industry is we are demolishing every building with asbestos still in it. We know that because on every house that we take down and every building we take down, we're being told that it's clear of asbestos. We bring in our own professional to look through and retest. And we're having at least two asbestos callbacks on every deconstruction. Meaning the only way to actually make our buildings safe to remove is to deconstruct them as we peel the layers back. Um, this is something we're gonna be pushing uh, WorkSafe BC hard on this year and trying to get in front of the media as just an added benefit of why we really need to stop demolishing buildings. And then there's a social impact. So I've talked about the affordable housing through Habitat for Humanity. On top of that, um, we come into communities and we turn a negative experience of a demolition quickly into a positive one. We see people that are very upset about buildings coming down and we're, we're upset about some of these buildings coming down as well. We're not out there promoting tearing down our heritage. We are firm believers in our heritage, but when a building owner has already made that decision, we're out there to make sure that that house or that building doesn't go to the landfill. Um, so I, I wanna make it clear that we need to preserve our heritage buildings better um, and buildings that are coming down, that's where we need to make sure they're deconstructed. And that leads into policy change. So I've, again, I'm very active with certain municipalities in, in Southern BC. And we've seen, uh, we're seeing in Vancouver and Victoria mandated deconstruction coming into play in 2021, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm going to continue to work with uh, various municipalities, provinces, and, and on the federal level as well, which I haven't touched into yet. Um, because again, I'm not out here to just grow a, a big business. I do want ability to be a big business, but as a leader, and I want to see and be part of the change of an industry as a, a wider um, scoping systemic change. Um, we, need, we need building codes to change. We need abatement to be more scrutinized and level the playing field. And I really believe that we need to see federal subsidies to incentivize deconstruction over demolition. Um, and just touching back on the circularity, um, myself as a builder, there's a lot that we're going to see happen in the construction industry over the next 10 years. Um, we need to see unbuilding or deconstruction become mandatory. We need to see used building materials going back into new construction and renovations. We will start to see policy in that department as well in both Vancouver and Victoria. And we really need to start seeing the industry take end of life into account more. Design for disassembly is, is a buzzword that's going around the industry. Um, and we're also seeing a, a greater push towards prefabrication, modular construction and wood construction as it's significantly lighter impact than concrete and steel. So our tagline is, it's not waste, it's just wasted. You can see on the left-hand side, a demolition site and on the right-hand side, what a site looks like and what the materials look like leaving our site. And it's obvious to us what the future is 
uh, of the demolition deconstruction sector. Amazing. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I know we have a whole bunch of questions in the chat, but we don't, I don't know if we necessarily have time to get to them at the moment. So I'm going to try and like, I'll save the chat and I'll try and reply to each of you who have asked questions <laughs> or I'll email you all. Um, but I do have a hand from Will. So Will, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, great. Thanks, Alex. And thanks so much, Adam. This is really, really eye opening. I'm just wondering, um, Vancouver has their own charter, but in the case of Victoria, um, the municipal action that was taken was that at the regional level through their their um, solid waste service that is what kickstarted work in Victoria, or um, was it something directly done by, by the municipality? I, I honestly don't know the ins and outs of how they're going to pass that that uh, bylaw because I know Vancouver is they operate differently. Um, it's not in place yet. I just have. I've been speaking with their sustainability department for about a year and a half and uh, Mayor Lisa helps as well. And I know that they're putting forward legislation uh, to mayor and council in the next month or two um, with the hope to have something approved um, kind of later this summer. But I, on, I don't know how they're gonna push that forward. Well, maybe when you get uh, some more information on what the sort of specific steps municipalities can take are, that'd be great to share it back with us because uh, that's, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. And it'd be great to have an idea of how Victoria got the gun. Thanks so much. Yeah. And that's, that's something that um, why I'm, I'm excited to be presenting to this group and also looking, uh, I did a presentation to the provincial government last week as well, because I know the provincial government actually dictates building code, which demolition falls under. So I've realized that I've been dealing with every municipality I can. And if I actually am successful going to the province, um, it can be a greater impact to, to be more blanketed um, as well as then on a federal level. So that's, that's where I've shifted my focus. But again, happy to work with any municipality and we're working in many municipalities in the lower mainland, Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. So um, this is happening in most communities even though there's legislation that's yet to come. And just as a quick follow up, who in, in your company should people follow up with if they want to get a sort of a more of a, a lens on, on municipal policy and how to engage? Would it be you uh, or is there someone else yes. whose email you could drop in the chat? No, that, that, that'll that go to me. Perfect, uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. It's just adam at unbuilders.com. And I'll, I'll share my slides with Alex, I guess, and she can share them in the group. and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to engage. That's that's a major part of my role. Amazing, thank you. And then can we go to Rick quickly? Sorry, I realized that we're running out of time, but. Just just really quickly, Adam, are you available to make presentations to councils directly? I would love to have you come uh, and, and present at our committee of the whole, if you could. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Excellent, thank you. I'll send an email. Amazing, thank you. Um, anyone else really quickly? Uh, I'm seeing the last comment about Ontario, which I'm from Ontario, and I want nothing more than to see on builders in Ontario. So I have been talking with the Toronto, uh, city of Toronto. Um, yeah, there's a big, we have a big uh, interest and push to get to Ontario, but there's a lot of legwork that has to happen right now, especially in the GTA, because you can still demolish buildings with drywall intact. You're, we're seeing demolition prices in Toronto, like $8,000. We just can't compete. Um, so there's a lot that has to happen first, which is more around the waste regulation before there's deconstruction policy. You actually don't even need deconstruction policy if there's waste regulation that doesn't allow mixed loads to landfills. And um, if there's some checking that happens with demolition contractors at a city level, which is what Vancouver's done. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Those were all three of those presentations were so good. I hope everyone else is just as inspired as I am. Um, and yeah, and just so everybody knows, um, a few of our wonderful um, members have put forward some resolutions for UBCM, like Union of British Columbia municipalities um, for all three of these initiatives. 
And um, so if you are in another province and would like to be doing something like that at your municipal, provincial municipal organization, um, reach out to me and I can share them with you. Um, and if you're in BC and you wanna jump on board with that, um, I think we're past the deadline. I think, I think today is the last day or tomorrow that you could um, put them forward for your area associations, but there'll be more to do as UBCM comes forward. So we would love some provincial legislation for these things. Um, and yeah, and so sorry for going over time a little bit, but I hope you all have a wonderful week and thank you so much everybody.